Well, once again, happy Mother's Day, and uh, to each of the women here at Central, we are so thankful for every single one of you. Uh, so grateful to have you as, as a part of this church, a part of the body of Christ, in your impact, in your influence on each of the, of the lives of, the, of those around you. I know the other night uh, I was not here, but I was told that the ladies who were here the other night had a great time. Um, and, and a great outing that they had together, and I heard specifically about some that I'm related to and some of the outfits that they were wearing. I don't know, I've just, just heard, heard the people didn't even recognize my own mother, so uh, I don't know, I don't know. If you weren't here, you missed out, so sounds like it was a great, great evening, and they had a fantastic time together, so when you get those opportunities, make sure you, you uh, come out and are a part of those opportunities. Well, this morning we're going to continue in our series in the book of Acts um, called The Gospel in Motion. And really that's what we're seeing um, throughout these early portions still of the book of Acts. Um, last week I titled my, my message, An Object in Motion. And uh, we started out talking science, didn't we, as we talked about um, last week's message, we, we, uh, we talked about uh, Newton's first law of motion, an object at rest stays at rest, an object in motion stays in motion with the same speed, the same direction, unless acted upon by an unbalanced force. And so after titling last week's message, an object in motion, I've titled this week's message, stays in motion, because we're talking about the gospel staying in motion, continuing to go forward. And we use the law of motion as, as an illustration to help us to continue to think about the gospel moving forward, even in the face of opposition. And that's exactly what's starting to take place. And as we go forward here through this week and into next week, we're going to see very clearly that there is some, some major opposition, persecution, that is taking place, and yet the gospel continues to move forward. And listen, that's the power of the gospel, Romans 6, 1, 16, right? That's the power of his word continuing to move forward. Well, this morning we're in Acts chapter 7, it's page 533. I'm going to warn you ahead of time, we have a huge text, probably one of the largest uh, passages I've ever tried to tackle in a message the good news is this, I had thought maybe we should include last week's message and this week's message in one message. The guys thought I was a little crazy talking me out of that, which was a good call on their part. But still, this week, we're going to look at all of chapter 7, which is 60 verses, okay? So you need to kind of buckle up, all right? You need to kind of prepare yourself that I'm going to do my best to, to kind of work through a long text um, really quickly, and, and I just want to encourage you, stick, stick with me. It's, it's, it's going to be a little bit of a challenge this morning. First service uh, went, went really good, so don't worry. Nobody, nobody left. I may have put a, a, a newborn baby to sleep, but uh, you know what? That's, that worked out really good for the parents. So, um, Last week, we ended with a bit of a, a cliffhanger with Stephen, and we took a look at the end of chapter 6 as, as he's an individual that selected to serve, right? They, they, uh, they needed some individuals to rise up to meet the needs within the church. Stephen was one of seven chosen to serve. And he rises up to do that, initially starting out serving tables. But we quickly find by the end of chapter 6 that this guy steps up in a lot bigger way. And, and you begin to realize how God's working in his life. We begin to, be, begin to realize that God's clearly equipped him in some unique ways and gifted him in, in some different areas. And most importantly noted in Acts 6-9 as, as these individuals, the council, these religious leaders, start to dispute with Stephen. But we noted very clearly that they couldn't withstand the wisdom with which he was speaking, nor the Holy Spirit. The guy's filled with the Spirit, and that's a key part of the life of Stephen that continues to show up. We'll see it again in chapter 7 this morning. So what do they do? Well, these religious leaders, they don't like Stephen. They don't like the message that he's, that he's giving, so they try to, to uh, dispute with him, argue with him. That's not working, so what do they do? They get some individuals to make up some claims, right, that he is blaspheming uh, Moses, the law, the temple, that he is blaspheming really their uh, religious heritage and, and, and they don't like it so they decide all right we're gonna we're gonna trip this guy up and we're gonna make some things up even if we have to make them up 
but this guy's going down, right? And so they bring him before the religious council, and standing before them, it says, Acts 6, 15, gazing at him, all who sat in the council saw that his face was like the face of an angel. Really interesting to think through that passage. We talked about it quickly last week. But then chapter 7, verse 1, and the high priest, possibly Caiaphas, the same one who convicted Jesus, uh, said, are these things so? And we're going to dive into Stephen's answer to that question. Because really, um, the rest of, of, of the chapter, for the most part, is about his answer to that question. Are the things that are said about you, are the, the claims that are against you, are they true? Are these things so? Well, last week I gave you three points um, talking about the gospel being in motion. When the gospel's in motion, be prepared for pushback. We're going to build off of these. So if you're a note taker, maybe you weren't even here last week, these were last week's points. You don't even have to go back and listen to last week's message. I'll give it to you here in two minutes, okay? All right? When the gospel's in motion, be prepared for pushback, right? When the gospel's moving forward, that's when we receive pushback in our lives, right? Number two, rely on the Spirit. That's exactly what Stephen does time and time and time again. We can see that throughout chapter 6 and 7. And then thirdly, be ready to give an answer. Stephen's asked this question, are these things so? Stephen's very ready to give an answer. We looked at 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15. It says this, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason, for the hope that is in you, yet do it with gentleness and respect. Well, I'm going to give you three more points to build off of that this morning. This being part two, really, of, of a bigger sermon. And um, so let's, let's dive into this. Well, Stephen's ready to give an answer. And as we look at this, we, we talked about this, you know, the reality is we could have taken this chapter and we could have split it up into a number of different weeks, right? We could have looked at it over the course of the next month pretty easily. There's a lot to this message, but I think that uh, my, my concern is this. I want to make sure that you catch the overall idea of what's going on here and the overall message that Stephen gives because what we're going to recognize is that he's going to give an Old Testament summary in 10 to 11 minutes. I mean, if we were to read word for word what he says here, that's about how long it takes to read it. Bad news is this. I'm not done in the next 10 or 11 minutes, okay? Sorry. All right, Stephen's better than me at it, but we're going to work through this. Chapter 7, verse 1 says this. The high priest said, are these things so? And Stephen, verse 2 said, brothers and fathers. Notice the respect that he offers immediately in his address to them. Brothers and fathers. Not only does it show respect, but it shows the relationship that's there. He recognizes himself really as one of them, as a fellow Jew, right? Brothers and fathers, hear me. Like, hear me out, all right? And then he says this. The God of glory appeared to our father Abraham when he was in Mesopotamia before he lived in Haran and said to him, go out from your land and from your kindred and go into the land that I will show you. Then he went out from the land of the Chaldeans, lived in Haran, and after his father died, God removed him from there into this land into which you are now living. Interesting to note what takes place there with Abraham, that he waits until after the death of his father before he moves on. Verse 5, yet he gave him no inheritance in it, not even a foot's length. But he promised to give it to him as a possession and to his offspring after him, though he had no child. And God spoke to this effect that his offspring would be sojourners in the land belonging to others who would enslave them and afflict them for 400 years. Talk about faith, right? He's, he's starting out with this introdu introduction talking about Abraham and he says, listen, talk, talk about faith. Abraham was given this promise that he wouldn't even see fulfilled. Not only that, he's encouraged with the fantastic news that his descendants would be in slavery for 400 years. Woohoo, right? Imagine receiving that for a minute, all right? Our nation's not even close to 400 years old, right? And he gets this message that he's going to have this promise, but you're not going to see it fulfilled. In fact, your descendants are going to be in, in captivity for 400 years. Abraham has incredible faith. I encourage you to take a look at Hebrews chapter 11. Chapter 
talks all about the, the faith of those that, that's lived out. It really talks a lot about Abraham in that chapter. In fact, it says this, Hebrews 11, 8. Abraham didn't even know where he was going. Didn't even know where he was going, yet lived by faith. Notice as, as, as well, just a little chunk from Hebrews 11 to whet your appetite there. They died in faith. Not having received the things promised, but having seen them and greeted them from afar, and having acknowledged that they were strangers and exiles on the earth. They didn't belong, right? For people who speak thus make it clear that they are seeking a homeland. If they'd been thinking of that land from which they'd gone out, they'd have had opportunity to return. But as it is, they desired a better country that is a heavenly one. And we could talk a whole lot more about that. But the reality is, Abraham lived by faith. He doesn't see the promise fulfilled. He's even told that his family would end up in captivity. Listen to what it says Verse 7, but I will judge the nation that they serve, said God, and after that they'll sh they shall come out and worship me in this place. And he gave him the covenant of circumcision. Circumcision was the sign of God's covenant with Abraham. And so Abraham became the father of Isaac, circumcised him on the eighth day. Isaac, the father of Jacob. Jacob, the twelve patriarchs. Now let's make a couple of observations, all right? You, you might be thinking, hold on a second. He's brought before the religious leaders in Jerusalem, before this religious council, right? And he's asked this question, talking about some of the things that he's said, and they're, they're trying to trip him up. They're trying to make, hey, did, did you say these things? Are these things so? Did you say some things about Moses, the law, the temple? Is that so? And he says, let me tell you about Abraham. Right? Is he trying to avoid the question? Would be... Uh, maybe an observation or, or, or a question that we might have, right? Is he trying to avoid these things by talking about Abraham? Uh, after all, it's, it's about the law and Moses, Jesus, the temple, but he's not really answering the question. He, in fact, he doesn't even try to defend himself, right? I mean, if somebody says, hey, you said, you're quickly, if you didn't say it like, I didn't say that, actually, this is what I said. Stephen doesn't even do any of that. He's brought before the council, and he starts going into this long description about Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And listen, the reason that he does this is number four, because he knows his audience. As the gospel is put in motion, we need to know our audience. You need to know your audience. As you take the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ to those in your life, you need to know who you are talking to. You need to know uh, where they're coming from. You need to kind of figure that out because how uh, and, and somebody grew up and the things that they know and where they are and what they're about will change the way you share the gospel with individuals. That's why Stephen starts where he starts. To us, it doesn't make any sense, but can I tell you this? To his audience, it makes perfect sense. He knows his audience, number four. And number five, right along with that, know your stuff. Know your stuff, right? As we think about Stephen here, he knows who he's talking to, and he knows what he's talking about. He, he goes through, and, and we're going to see as we go through chapter 7, there's this long explanation that, that kind of weaves through, and we start to, as we go through, I'll point out some more things that help us kind of understand what he's talking about, but the reality is this, he knows who he's talking to. They're religious leaders that know the Old Testament inside and out. And so he's very, uh, very deliberately going through and explaining some things about it. He's not trying to act like he doesn't know some things, right? And I think one of the greatest, uh, a way that we can bring damage when, when we're trying to share the good news of the gospel with somebody is to act like we have the answers and we don't, okay? Somebody asks you a question and you're trying to share the good news of the gospel with them, they ask you a question and you don't know what it is, don't act like you know, because they'll see right through you. You're better off saying, you know what, I'm not really sure about that, but if you'll give me an opportunity, I'd like to go back and take a look and maybe study that, maybe ask somebody some questions about that, and I'll get back to you and make sure you follow up. But that's a whole lot better response than acting like we know. The reality is Stephen did know. He, he knew exactly what he was talking about. He knew he was, who he was addressing. He was, he was very clear in what he was talking about, and he's not prideful. 
He communicates it, like Peter says, with gentleness and respect. Look at verse 9. He goes on, right? Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, the twelve, right? The patriarchs, verse 9, and the patriarchs, jealous of Joseph, their brother, sold him into Egypt. But God was with him, rescued him out of all his afflictions, gave him favor and wisdom before Pharaoh, king of Egypt, who made him ruler over Egypt and over all his household. There was a famine throughout all Egypt and Canaan and great affliction, and our fathers could find no food. But when Jacob heard that there was grain in Egypt, he sent our fathers on their first visit. And on the second visit, Joseph made himself known to his brothers, and Joseph's family became known to all Pharaoh. And Joseph, right, they sold their brother into slavery. God puts him in a position of power, number two in the whole land. And not only puts him in a position of power, but puts him in a place where he can uh, help set up a plan to feed the known world. Really incredible. Joseph sent and summoned Jacob, his father, all of his family, 75 persons at all. Jacob went down into Egypt. He died. He and our fathers, they were carried back to Shechem, laid in the tomb Abram had bought. And Stephen keeps going, verse 17, as the time of promise drew near, which God had granted to Abraham, the people increased and multiplied, read Exodus, the beginning of Exodus, in Egypt, until there arose another, uh, another over Egypt, another king, who, jo who didn't know Joseph. He dealt shrewdly with our race, forced our fathers to expose their infants so that they would not be kept alive. And now he's going to start to talk about Moses. At this time, Moses was born. He's beautiful in God's sight. He was brought up for three months in his father's house. And when he was exposed, Pharaoh's daughter adopted him, brought him up as her own son. And Moses was instructed in all the wisdom of the Egyptians. And he was mighty in his words and deeds. Once again, God uses an unlikely individual in an unusual circumstance to be in a position to rescue his people. And he's starting to, to lay this, this foundation of God putting people in a position to rescue and note how people respond to them. Verse 23, when he was 40 years old, came into his heart to visit his brothers, right? He's living in the palace. Well, maybe I should go visit my people. And seeing one of them being wrong, he defended the oppressed man and avenged him by striking down the Egyptian. He supposed that his brothers would understand that God was giving them salvation by his hand, but they didn't understand. They didn't get it. So note what Stephen's doing here, okay? He, he's making it clear. God put these individuals in positions of, of, of leadership. And he's showing how, how God raised them up to be delivers, to bring salvation to his people. And these individuals weren't accepted. Joseph, right? His brothers didn't get it. Beautiful story. I encourage you to read the end of the book of Genesis. The story of Joseph, every year when I read through that, man, I love that section. It's just so interesting to know what takes place there. Happens with Joseph. They don't, they don't, they, they sell him into, into slavery, Right? God puts them in a position of power. Even after their father dies, they're like, hey, you aren't going to get revenge now, are you? Moses, right? He's in this incredible position. The, the babies are being killed. He's hidden. The, 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 the princess find, finds him, raises him up in the palace. You don't think God was involved in that? And yet the people didn't get it. Verse 26 says, On the following day when he appeared to them as they were quarreling, trying to reconcile them, saying, Men, you're brothers. Why do you wrong each other? But the man who was wronging his neighbor thrust him aside, saying, Who made you a ruler and judge over us? You want to kill me as you killed the Egyptian yesterday? And at this retort, Moses fled, went to the land of Midian, where he became the father of two sons. When 40 years had passed, an angel appeared to them, on Mount Sinai, in the flame of fire in a bush, when Moses saw it, he was amazed at the sight, drew near to take a look, and there came the voice of the Lord, I am the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And Moses trembled, didn't dare to look. The Lord said to him, take off your sandals for your feet, for the place where you're standing is holy ground. I have surely seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt, have heard their groaning, and I have come down to deliver them. And now come, I will send you to Egypt." 
It, it's amazing, right? It, you take a look at, at what happens throughout Genesis and Exodus, and you think of the life of, of Moses, and there's this reality that, that God raises him up, and even Moses is like, no, not me, I can't talk. I'm not the guy. Well, yeah, you are. It's very clear. And so he gives Aaron to help him out. But then there's the reality of the people's response, right? But do you see what Stephen's doing? He's eventually going to get to Jesus. That's what he's trying to get to. But what he's doing is he's laying this foundation of the pattern that takes place throughout the Old Testament. Uh, God raises somebody up, but the people don't respect him or follow him. The people do not listen. They reject him. In fact, verse 35 says, This Moses whom they rejected, saying, Who made you a ruler and a judge? This man God sent as both ruler and redeemer. I love the word that he uses there. By the hand of the angel who appeared to him in the bush, this man led them out, performing wonders and signs in Egypt, at the Red Sea, in the wilderness for 40 years. This is the Moses who said to the Israelites, God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your brothers. He's, he's kind of setting within here all of these, these things that are beginning to point to Jesus, the Redeemer. This is the one, verse 38, who is in the congregation of the wilderness with the angel who spoke to him at Mount Sinai and our fathers. He received the living oracles to give to us, right? The Ten Commandments, the law. Our fathers refused to obey him, thrust him aside, and in their hearts they turned to Egypt, saying to Aaron, make for us gods who will go before us. Then, verse 41, they made the calf in those days, they sacrificed to idols. God, verse 42, turned away, gave them over to the worship of the host of heaven, as is written in the book of the prophets. Did you bring to me slain beasts and sacrifices during the 40 years in the wilderness, O house of Israel? You took up the tent of Moloch, the star of your god Ruffin, the images that you made to worship, and I will send you into exile beyond Babylon. And, and what he's doing is continually showing them, listen, God raises somebody up, but the people don't listen. He's now going to begin to really move quickly. Verse 44. Our fathers had the tent of, wilderness, of witness in the wilderness, right? The presence of God. Just as he who spoke to Moses directed him to make it. According to the pattern that he had seen, our fathers in turn brought it in with Joshua when they disposed the nations that God drove out before our fathers. So it was until the days of David, right? He's moving right along now who found favor in the sight of God and asked to find a dwelling place for the God of Jacob, but it was Solomon who built the temple, right? Yet, verse 48, yet the Most High does not dwell in houses made by hands, as the prophet says, heaven is my throne, earth is my footstool, what kind of house will you make for me, says the Lord, or what is the place of my rest? Did not my hand make all these things? Now, all right, take a breath, all right? Some of you, maybe that coffee will start to kick in a little bit, all right? We've made it through the tough part. But what he is doing is he's not as much addressing the accusations, although he is a little bit here. Remember one of the, the, the accusations that was made uh, about him was regarding the temple, right? That God would destroy the temple in three days and God, Christ was clearly talking about his own body. He was blaspheming the temple, they said. And it's interesting to note as you look at verses 47, 48, 49, 50, that he uses the words of Solomon or, or he uses the example of Solomon, the words of Isaiah, to point out that the temple was a representation, representation of God's presence. The Sanhedrin was limiting God to the temple and he's making it really clear, listen, God's the one who said, didn't my hand make all these things? Are you going to build me a house and contain me there? I don't think so. Way bigger. And so now he's laid this huge foundation, right? And now he's about to go on the offensive. Take a look at what he says in verse 51. You stiff-necked people. By the way, if you're looking for some uh, words to use with evangelism, these are not ones to use, all right? People will probably shut down pretty quick if you call them a stiff-necked individual, okay? You stiff-necked people, uncircumcised in heart and ears, you always resist the Holy Spirit. As your fathers did, so do you. Remember all the examples that he's just mentioned? Joseph, Moses, Abraham, 
David, he's used all these examples all throughout. He's like, listen, which, verse 52, which of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? And they killed those who announced beforehand the coming of the righteous one whom you have now betrayed and murdered. He's pointing right to Jesus. You who received the law as delivered by angels and did not keep it. Like of all people, you should know. You're the religious leaders. How did you not get it? And don't you realize that just like your fathers killed and murdered all the prophets, you killed and murdered the Messiah. That's what he's saying to them. It's interesting to consider what he says there, especially there, verse 52. Which of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? Sounds so similar to what Jesus says just a couple of days before he goes to the cross, before they crucified him. Jesus would say this in the temple court, Luke eleven forty-seven: 47, Woe to you, speaking to the religious leaders, for you build the tombs of the prophets whom your fathers killed. So your witnesses and you consent to the deeds of your fathers, for they killed them, you build their tombs. Therefore also the wisdom of God said, I will send them prophets and apostles, some of whom they will kill and persecute. Sounds just like what Stephen's saying. So that the blood of all the prophets shed from the foundation of the world may be charged against this generation. Listen, the reality is this. They didn't like what Jesus said just a couple of days before they crucified him. And i got to think that Stephen, as he brings this out in his challenge, in his admonishing of the religious leaders, he knows exactly what happened to Jesus. Jesus said those words, and two days later, they killed him. And the reality is, Stephen says very similar words, and in about two minutes, they're going to kill him. Verse 54, now when they heard these things, they were enraged and they ground their teeth at him. Thought about having somebody demonstrate that for us, but sounds a little odd. But he, take this note again, full of the Holy Spirit, verse 55, gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. We can only wonder at what Stephen observed in this moment. And he said, Behold, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. And in our human minds, we might be quick to say, well, he probably shouldn't have said that out loud. Maybe they wouldn't have killed him. Stephen knew exactly what he was doing. But they cried out with a loud voice. They stopped their ears. They rushed together at him. Verse 58, they cast him out of the city and stoned him. Stephen, I think, very clearly knows what he's doing. I I really think he counts the cost. Notice the end of verse 58, and the witnesses laid down their garments at the feet of a young man named Saul. I love how Luke writes the book of Acts. It almost gives a couple of teasers as to what's coming ahead. Talk about the gospel in motion. They lay their garments while stoning Stephen at the feet of the guy who would write a good portion of the New Testament later on. Listen, we often see things take place in the world through the here and now of life without ever contemplating what God might be doing. If we were here in this moment, I got to believe that we would be wrecked in the moment, if nothing else, by observing what takes place. But not only that, we'd probably be in hiding, we'd probably be freaked out by what's going on. That's not what happens. That's not what happens with the church. Yes, we'll see in a moment they're scattered, but God uses the difficult things to take the gospel to those who need it. And Stephen, I think, very clearly counts the cost of what 
is about to take place. He knows what happened to Jesus when he said, woe to you, scribes, Pharisees, hypocrites. And yet he almost, word for word at times, speaks some of the same words of Jesus. In fact, even in the last two statements that he ever makes, notice exactly what they sound like. Verse 59, as they were stoning Stephen, he called out, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Sound a little bit like the Easter message? Stephen's phrase, Lord, receive my spirit, the last words of Jesus on the cross, into your hands, I commit my spirit. Verse 60, and falling to his knees, he cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. When he said this, he fell asleep. He died. Stephen cries out, do not hold this sin against them. Jesus cried out, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. So interesting how two of his very final statements go hand in hand with two of the statements of Christ on the cross. Listen, martyrdom is something that happens to Christians way more often than you and I realize. I was listening to something from Voice of the Martyrs this week, and they came out with a statement that said this, in the time it takes for a church service to take place, 12 Christians will have died for their faith. That's going on in the world today. We've had two services this morning. That's 24. Persecution of, of the church is very, very real. And you, and you know, it, you've probably heard this before, maybe not, but the persecuted church prays for us because it's so easy to be lukewarm in the culture and in the society in which we live. As I thought about the persecution of the church, Jesus, in his first public message, the Sermon on the Mount, made it very clear, blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. I can't help but think of Stephen. That word blessed means a deep abiding happiness. A deep abiding happiness comes to those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Stephen lives that out. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute and, and, and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. That's Stephen. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven, for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. It's almost like Stephen heard that as well. Stephen, like the apostles, was counted worthy to suffer for the name of Jesus, but he here in chapter 7 with his life. You, you might be thinking, so how in the world is, is this the gospel in motion? How is Acts chapter 7 the gospel in motion. Well, we already pointed out in the end of verse 58 that they laid their garments at the feet of a young man named Saul. But I want you to, to, to look forward just a little bit. We'll talk about this next week more in depth. But chapter 8, verse 4 says, Now those who were scattered went about preaching the word. The reality was Paul started to persecute the church, greatly persecute the church having people killed for their faith, and yet those who were scattered, they left the area. God used the scattering of the church in Jerusalem to take the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ to the known world. It, it ended up taking the gospel and spreading it. And as we'll see in the weeks to come, the persecution, the scattering, it led to the growth of the church at large. And like we said last week, the gospel in motion stays in motion even when acted upon. 
So even in this picture of, of Stephen laying down his life for the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the gospel continues to move forward. Listen, we need to pray for our brothers and sisters who are, are dealing with persecution in a very, very real way. We need to pray that they would boldly speak the name of Jesus. We need to pray that they would rise up with strength like ones like Stephen did and that they would be blessed, Matthew chapter 5. We got it pretty easy, don't we? As we look at this passage, I think it's important for us to stop and recognize that, yeah, things are pretty messed up in the world. Things are pretty messed up in our country. But the reality is we still got it pretty good. And what we see here in Acts chapter 7 has not yet, although I think will be, at some point in time, it's not yet here. Therefore, as we think about the gospel being in motion, consider the observations that we've made of the life of Stephen. Right? He was prepared for pushback. He, he was relying on the Spirit, number two. He was ready to give an answer. He knew his audience. He knew his stuff. And number six, he had a calculated approach. All along, as he goes through this chapter, you see a very calculated approach of how he takes the good news of the gospel to those that are in front of him. I think there's a lot that we can take away from that today with those that are in our lives. I, I got to tell you, there's some people in my life right now, and I can think of two very specifically. That, that I have a very specific approach, really, with their lives. It, when I sit down and talk with the one about the gospel, my conversation with him is drastically different than when I sit down with the other one because of where they're at. They're in very different places in life. They're 20 years apart, for one thing, but they're in very different places of, of, of how... They're trying to, to understand God's Word, and they're trying to understand the Scriptures. Listen, we got to have an approach that recognizes the people that we are ministering to, the people that we are attempting to take the Gospel to, and think about how they're receiving things from their shoes. Now listen, I'm, I'm going to be very clear when I say that. We still preach Christ crucified, okay? And we preach it boldly. In fact, as you think about that, I want you to listen to what 1 Corinthians 1, verse 18 says, For the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it's the power of God. They're not going to all get it. I, I'm praying that these guys in my life will come to know Jesus Christ as their Savior. But we preach Christ crucified. 1 Corinthians 1, 23. It's a stumbling block to the Jews. It's folly to Gentiles. But to those who are called, it's Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than men and the weakness of God is stronger than men. You, you want some supplemental material? Go home and read 1 Corinthians 1 and 2 this week. Because I think there's a lot more that we can learn about how we Share the gospel. Paul says in chapter 2, I didn't come with lofty speech and wisdom to you. Could Paul have done that? Absolutely, Paul could have done that in Corinth. He says, I didn't do it so that your faith, 1 Corinthians 2, 5, might not rest in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. That's the power of the gospel. Paul was very calculated in Corinth. Read, we're going to get to it eventually. Acts chapter uh, 18, he visits Corinth. Acts chapter 17, um, in Thessaloniki, in um, Athens. He's very calculated with what he does. And as we take the gospel, we got to recognize we don't base our message on our wisdom and what we know, but we base it on Christ crucified, the power of God. That was Paul's message. And so as we go from here today, as we go out of this place, as we go through our week, we need to invest in the lives of those around us to the point by which they hear clearly the good news of the gospel of Christ. And listen, be prepared, because they might be like those in Acts chapter 7. They might not stone you, okay? 
They might not take you out back and stone you, but they might reject the good news of the gospel of Christ. But let's not put some hindrance in the way. Let's boldly proclaim it. Let's do it with gentleness and respect. And as Paul says in Colossians chapter 4, listen to what he says. He says, continue steadfastly in prayer. I want to encourage you, there are individuals in your life, family members, neighbors, co-workers, loved ones, friends, pray for them. Continue steadfastly in prayer for those individuals. Pray, invest, invite, right? Listen to what he says. Pray, being watchful in it with thanksgiving. At the same time, he says, pray for us that God may open to us a door for the word that I might to, de to declare the mystery of Christ on, which, on account of which I am in prison, that I may make it clear, which is how I ought to speak. There's some great points of prayer here, right? Pray, continue steadfastly in prayer. Pray that we make it clear, which is how we ought to speak. And then he says this in verse 5 and 6. Walk in wisdom toward outsiders, towards those who don't know Jesus. Making the best use of the time. Let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how you ought to answer each person. So a couple things as a takeaway. Listen, the gospel in motion stays in motion even when acted upon. That's Acts chapter 7. We see it into Acts 8 and following. And as we go throughout our lives, we need to keep in mind the reason that we're here. The reason that you live where you live, that you work where you work, that you go to school where you do, is to make disciples, passionate followers of Jesus Christ. Be intentional with those who are in your life. Take these observations from Stephen and live it out. But listen, we need to be a church that keeps the gospel in motion. Let's pray. God, we come before you today. Give us boldness. Give us strength to respond with wisdom, with discernment, through the power of your spirit and the power of the good news of the gospel of Christ. Lord, I, I thank you for those that are here today. I know that many of them are very intentional with those that are in their lives. Continue to, to give them strength and encouragement. Help them to be bold. Help them to be respectful. Help them to be calculated in their approach. Help them to rely on your spirit, to be in the word, to know their stuff. And Lord, we pray for those in our lives that don't know Christ. We ask and we pray that your spirit would do the work that only you can do. God, help us to plant seeds. Help us to till soil. Help us to water seeds. But God, we're asking in Jesus' name that you would give the increase. Lord, help us to be a church that is all about the gospel. Paul says it's of the utmost importance. It's of first importance. Help us to be that kind of a church. Help us not to become like the, the religious council in Acts 7 that has come up with what we want and tradition and but help us to preach Christ crucified help us to go from here today in your strength and in your power and Lord once again I want to thank you for all the moms pray that you'd bless their day for all the women of this church thankful for every single one and I pray as well for those that this is a difficult day God I pray that you would comfort them with the comfort that only you can give through the power of your spirit. God, bless the remainder of this day. We ask and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.